Hi, I'm Bodhisattva Shadhu. I'm a research scientist at IBM Teacher Watson Research Center. The title of my distinguished microwave lecture is Silicon-Based Millimeter Wave Phased Rays for 5G, Fundamentals to Future Trends. Let's start with some data. This plot shows how much data we are downloading and uploading on our mobile networks versus time. So the x-axis is time going from 2014 all the way to 2021. In writing on the success of LTE, we have seen a stunning growth in mobile data. The amount of data has grown by more than 2000% going from 2014 all the way to 2021. And you can see, clearly see the exponential trend here. Now, if you extrapolate from this exponential as predicted by the Ericsson Mobility Report this year, here is what we get. We can see that we expect an almost 5x further increase in mobile data traffic in the next five years, maybe even more. The burden of this demand will have to be carried by newer technologies as LTE runs out of steam as shown here, and this is where 5G mobile comes in. But what is 5G? At a high level, here is a vision of what 5G wants to be. It will be many of these things, while others may happen later for 6G or even further down the road. But overall, 5G wants to be an overarching network infrastructure. Different technologies would be used under the umbrella for a variety of functions from broadband data access, smart vehicles, IoT, machine-to-machine -machine communications, remote robot control. In this talk, I will focus on what is possibly the poster child of the 5G story, high-speed data access enabled by millimeter waves. What are millimeter waves? As shown in the top, uh, millimeter wave frequencies are frequencies for which the wavelength is between one millimeter and 10 millimeter in free space. This corresponds to around 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz of frequency. And you can see some of the popular use cases and potential use cases at these different frequency bands from 5G uh, and to so on. But in this talk, we mostly focus on 5G, uh, where the frequency range is between 24 and 40 gigahertz. Now, the big advantage of going to millimeter wave frequencies, which is why 5G is moving there as well, is the availability of much larger bandwidth. And this bandwidth for communications applications translates to much higher data rates. Now, while millimeter wave certainly seems to be the new kid on the block, fascinatingly, uh, this is far from the truth. In fact, in 1895, two years before Marconi founded his wireless telegraph and signal company, a scientist in then British India, J.C. Bose, demonstrated millimeter wave communication, used frequencies as high as 60 gigahertz to wirelessly ring a bell a few rooms away. In this demonstration, he used horn antennas and waveguides and semiconductor junctions. And really, his test setup doesn't look too different from a millimeter wave test setup in some of our labs today. It is quite an astonishing story, and I encourage you to find out more uh, in this review paper from 1997. Bose wasn't quite excited by the idea of commercializing its invention and never attempted commercialization. However, more objectively, and somewhat unfortunately for him, he was also well ahead of his time. The millimeter wave frequencies that he had chosen were difficult to transmit over long distances compared to much lower frequencies that Marconi was using, for example. And back then, people weren't really looking for uh, the lazy joy of asking Alexa to turn on the light at the other end of the room. The technology that would overcome the distance hurdle of millimeter wave, namely phased rays, was discovered a few years later. The first demonstration of a phased ray was by Nobel laureate Carl Ferdinand Brown in 1905. However, this was again a theoretical demonstration with three antennas as shown here. And like many technologies that help with warfare, antenna radars began gaining traction during World War II for both the Allied and Axis forces. Here shown is the 36 element um, SCR-270 antenna radar. And that was the one that detected the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor during World War II, when the Japanese planes were still 250 kilometers away. Unfortunately for the Americans, they ignored those warnings. And many more phased rays uh, and phased ray radars then were built during the Cold War. Here is an impressive example, the PAVE pause radar with 2,677 elements. 
From those early demonstrations more than 100 years ago, we are now beginning to have millimeter wave phase ray radios inside our pockets. For example, if you look at the recent Samsung and Apple phones, they all have millimeter wave radios and sensors inside. It has been quite a fascinating journey going over these 100 uh, and more years, and it has relied on implementing millimeter wave phased ray circuits in silicon technology. So in this DML talk, I will go into the details of what phased rays are and how to design and integrate these phased ray circuits in technologies like we have today. In terms of how the high level idea works, here is a vision of millimeter wave 5G that companies like the Ericsson, Samsung's, Verizon's and Qualcomm's of the world had uh, back in 2014. Having seen the development of millimeter wave and phase rays, mostly in the 60 gigahertz band, they thought they could use millimeter wave base stations and have them create beams as shown here. And then these beams could point at different users and we could switch beams from one user to the other and they would be used in a time division duplexed fashion to serve the multiple users in a given geographical area. And this is just very different from how things had been before with 1G all the way through 4G LTE, where communication beams were omnidirectional, so they were transmitted really in all directions. A millimeter wave also was far from being a proven technology uh, at that time, especially silicon-based millimeter wave phased rays. Uh, Ericsson approached our team at IBM Research because we had experience with millimeter wave phase rays and together we built a phase ray testbed prototype in 2016. While it was developed really as a research prototype, it got a lot of interest within Ericsson and from Ericsson's clients and they productized it in a year time in around 2018 and soon Verizon had rolled out versions of the phase ray across the US. And now we have the Verizon ultra wideband 5G in 1,500 plus cities uh, that enjoy millimeter wave 5G service using versions of the chip that we had first built. So in this DML talk, I'll go into the details of the circuits that we used in this first 5G phase ray. Uh, the 32 element phase ray chip we built is shown here. It's about uh, 1.5 centimeters by one centimeter in terms of the size, and it's built in silicon germanium by CMOS technology. I also talk about the package and antenna design that enables near ideal phase ray characteristics even without using any calibration. I go through some of the demonstrations of this radio module, for example, beam forming by turning on elements one by one. So as you can see, as we turn on the elements, we have a beam that gets formed in space. And here is the measurement result of that beam being formed in space, uh, almost ideal in terms of how the beam should look. Similarly, um, I also show beam steering results where we use uh, beam control on chip to do very fast beam steering uh, across a particular range as shown here. Both the beam forming and beam steering are almost ideal as you expect from textbook MATLAB kind of demonstrations and represents a very sophisticated level of engineering that we are capable of in these radios today to be able to do this in hardware. And then for the final section of my talk, I'll take a peek into the future of communications and what that might have in store. And for this, I will look back really at the past 15 years in the context of wireless communication and distill down three factors. Number one is the integration of wireless devices with CMOS that has brought a lot of digital programmability to multi-antenna wireless radios. Number two, the increasing complexity of modern phased ray radios with digital control of hundreds of unique front end antenna elements, allowing signal control in frequency, time, and space. And three, the obvious uh, meteoric rise of AI technology, which has brought in a new paradigm to programming, including programming wireless radios um, that's likely going to happen very soon. And then if we combine these three technological drivers that I described with the economic driver for this exponential growth of wireless that we're expecting, uh, at least in the mobile perspective, it seems almost natural to recognize that all of these things will combine in the next generation of wireless devices where we see vertically integrated antenna to AI systems. So we can think of a huge research opportunity in the near future, bridging the gap between antennas and artificial intelligence. And the last part of the talk, I'll focus on how we fill this gap and how we can move forward in this direction to fulfill this alliance. 
So in this context, I'll present a software-defined phase tree radio, or SD-PAR, that we built at IBM Research. It's a portable software-controlled phase tree radio at 28 gigahertz and enables a fully ML-based software backend that can be developed on top of it. I described different high-level applications, such as how we can use this to null out in-band interferers or how we can create 3D image of the environment using reflected 5G signals. With that, we come to the end of this preview. I welcome you to find out more in my Distinguished Microwave Lecture. Thank you very much.